All right, so after some audio vids, I'm back with another camera vid. And well, you know what I'm going to talk about if you've read the thumbnail title, but please join me as I tell the story of how I went from the full frame Sony a7C to the GX9, which is being used to record this very own video. Let's go. So first off, I talked about this a bit before, about how Micro Four Thirds sensors tend to be kind of shrugged off as being inferior compared to their APS-C and full-frame counterparts. Uh, and at first, I kind of believed that as well, until I actually bought the Lumix GM1. Now, over the course of six-something months, I grew quite fond of it and the Micro Four Thirds system in general. What it lacked in capability, it made up for in having just a smaller body size and small lenses at a digestible price tag. Mind you, uh, all this time I had also owned the full-frame Sony a7C, yet the strangest thing happened. I knew that the a7C was the clearly technically superior camera. And even the 24 to 60 millimeter kit lens that it was paired with vastly outmatched the GM1's included 12 to 32 millimeter kit lens in sharpness. Yet when it came to it, I would always take the GM1 with me out on photo walks and never the A7C. It was just so light, so small, so easy to fit in the pocket that it never seemed like I had to consciously pack it with me it was always just something i would shove into my coat pocket and just walk with me and it enabled me to take some awesome pictures as you've seen so the a7c ended up just sitting around in storage only being used for you know video purposes uh which if i had only needed something for video i would have got the a7c uh, probably the zve1 also from sony would probably have been a lot more sensible with 10-bit recording and video centric controls as well as a lot more video centric features so eventually i decided that instead of leaving the a7c just to shoot video i think i would have I would want to sell my a7c along with the gm1 all of it to build up a sizable budget for a great micro four thirds camera that i can go all in with shopping lenses from the extra savings so having decided on a course of action now i have to think about what micro four thirds camera i i would buy and my requirements for this new micro four thirds camera were that first it needed to be beautiful. I've always preferred the squarish rangefinder look over the more rounded, blobby DSLR aesthetic of Canon. So that was set in stone. I, I'd, I'd want something that looks like that. And if it wasn't going to look like that, I wouldn't even bother. Second thing was I wanted something relatively compact still, but it would have more modern technology packed into it compared to the old Lumix GM1. And finally, it needed to be fairly affordable at around 500 bucks so that I would have some money to spare to buy more lenses. And wouldn't you know it, the Lumix GX9 was exactly that. Like, look at this camera and, and tell me it doesn't look nice. The GX9 is the culmination of design refinements from the GX7 and GX85, also known as the GX7 Mark II, which combines both a retro rangefinder styling, thanks to the silver top plate, those mesmerizing dual exposure and mode dials, along with a healthy dose of back and front scrolling with a multitude of function buttons, along with sharp, squared off corners for that modern sleekness. Now, as much as I love how Fuji cameras look in the pictures, in real life, the GX9's design, I think is actually better in my opinion. And I don't think any camera has a swiveling EVF like the GX9 here, except the old GX7. And another interesting thing is the lever that a GX9 uses. I'm not sure if this is just on my model, but it has a pleasant smell. Uh, I don't know, 
if they use some kind of lever conditioner, maybe it's the shop that sold it to me. But when I hold it, my fingers, it starts smelling kind of like Irish Spring soap. It's not a bad smell, honestly. Now, the GX9 is also a relatively modern camera with all the modern conveniences you've come to expect. So you get the 20 megapixel Micro Four Thirds sensor with no AA filter for extra sharpness. And the shutter noise is actually quite discreet. It's almost leaf shutter level, which emboldens the high tech feel. And you've got the electronic shutter too, in case you need those higher shutter speeds in daylight and for silent shooting. This is aided by a five-stop IBIS engine that has been very useful in my time shooting the GX9. Compared to the A7C, which has comparable IBIS, the GX9 seems to even be more stable. And it's, it's a bit lighter on my hands too, so I can keep it more steady in the long run. I've had shots with like a half second shutter speed that were steady and not blurry, which I wouldn't even trust my A7C to reliably achieve. Now the usage experience of the GX9 is also very effortless. Panasonic's menus are fairly intuitive. They actually make use of the touchscreen, unlike Olympus and Sony, and I quickly acclimated to it. The button layouts are also sensible. Everything is accessible by just your right hand. And I appreciate Panasonic's color profiles, which have a good amount of customizability to them, along with some very nice monochrome profiles that I actually used quite a lot. We'll show that a bit later. Another advantage I have switching to the GX9 and the Micro Four Thirds system are the stable of small pancake level lenses you can get which other systems rarely come close to in compactness and in price. So I'm sure that you remember my Olympus 17mm f2.8, which I scored for a measly $50. And look at this tiny little pancake, right? And I traded in my Lumix 1232mm kit lens for this 1442mm electronic zoom Olympus kit lens. Again, really versatile zoom option that's still compact and makes sharp photos. Also came with this uh, self-opening lens cap, which is awesome. Well, since then, I've actually added to the roster with the extra spare cash I had selling the Sony a7C. That being a $110 deal on this Olympus 25mm f1.8 that I scored from a fellow Olympus photographer, actually. So was a pretty good price for this lens. You've got this venerable 20 millimeter f1.7 Lumix pancake prime lens. Really cool, pretty cheap too. Again, it came in at about $130. It's the Mark II version, so hopefully a little bit faster focusing. And for portrait needs, I kind of cheaped out a bit and I got this Yong Nuo 42.5 millimeter f1.7 Mark II which uh, honestly, it is a bit less sharp compared to the Olympus and Panasonic Primes, but it serves me well enough for the odd portrait work that I do. And again, I only have to pay like 110 bucks for it. So again, very cheap for a pretty solid lens, I'd say. Oh, and for video purposes, I am using this Olympus 12 millimeter F2, which was a bit more pricey at 200 bucks. With that, I now have a variety of lenses covering most typical focal lengths from 24 millimeter if I want to do some wide landscape shots to 85 millimeter for portrait shots and some things in between, of course. And the best thing is I can fit almost all these lenses into my photography bag and the GX9 body. If I had to buy this many lenses for Sony E-mount and for full frame Sony E-mount even, they most definitely will not be as cheap and totally not as compact. Okay, enough gushing about gear. Let's show you what this GX9's Micro Four Thirds sensor can do.
as you can see in daylight and with good quality glass i get great pictures out of the gx90 it looks stylish on the streets but still utilitarian and with its sleekness and a small profile when paired with a kit lens or something like a pancake i find it very easy to take the camera out for a photo walk and have a potent street photography kit i set the button one of the function button to activate the monochrome preview feature which gives me a live view of the scene in black and white which makes your black and white photography a lot more deliberate and artful compared to making it black and white in post as sort of a way to save some bad photos you think it, it wouldn't work now even at night time i didn't have much to complain about the gx9 considering its sensor size I still get vet, get very usable photos at ISO 1600 and with processing the RAWs, I can even work ISO 3200 pretty nicely with ISO 6400 to be used in a pinch. Yes, this is not spectacular noise performance, but paired with fast primes, it's still very capable. Even if I can't push the ISO sky high like I did with the Sony a7C. And you know the weirdest thing about it is, I don't miss the ISO performance of the A7C. Uh, as I find the low ISO results of those files from the Sony to be too clean. And I would just end up adding noise in post anyway. So, you know, it kind of defeats that whole low ISO stuff. Now, that isn't to say that the GX9 is perfect. Its battery life is really lacking. It could be that because I bought used, the battery that came with it has been worn out over time. But regardless, you're gonna want some spares. It's also not the best for video considering that there is no mic jack at all. So right now I have to record externally the audio as you can see here and then sync them in post, which adds time to editing. And the screen can't be flipped out, so I kind of have to guess my framing. I've done this before, back when I owned the A6000 from Sony. So I can do it. Uh, for the most part, it's an acceptable compromise for now. There's also no 10-bit recording, but it also does do 8-bit 4K at 100 megabits per second, which is about the same as my Sony A7C. And the Cinelike D profile also gives a fairly flat picture that I can use in place of a log curve. Of course, it doesn't give me as much headroom for color grading in post, but for my shooting needs right now and for what you're seeing on the screen, I don't think I need that extra headroom. Ever since the GM1 video, all footage has been shot on my Lumix GX9 here. And I don't see anybody in the comments telling me that the picture quality of the video has got any worse. Heck, I even did a little social experiment and shared pictures with friends shot on the GX9. But I implied or labeled that it was shot with the A7C. And they really didn't notice any difference in picture quality. They didn't complain to me that the pictures suddenly got worse or anything. And it proves again that the photographer behind the camera matters more than the camera being used. Now, I'm not going to pretend like Micro Four Thirds is the end-all and be-all. It's not all you need and don't just go out and like sell all your Sony, Nikon, Fuji and Canon gear all that. Because for sure, the full frames and even the APS-C sensors still have more shallow depth of field and you can crank that ISO on the Sony camera sky high. Whereas I still have to be a bit mindful with the GX9. But for my needs, and I think for most people's needs, a Micro Four Thirds camera is more than enough. If nothing else, what I want you to take away from this video is that the photographer behind the camera is more important than the gear that you use. And if you're looking to photography as a hobby and perhaps a semi-professional career path, do not be swayed by detractors and consider the Micro Four Thirds system as a very lucrative and viable option. For me, it's the Lumix GX9, and I believe it and other Micro Four Thirds cameras will serve you well. But before we end the video, one more thing. I didn't just get the Lumix GX9. 
I got another camera.